The new PETA documentary, The Failed Experiment, executive produced by Bill Maher, is now available on YouTube. Go see it now. Originally, The Failed Experiment premiered on Prime Video, but now it can be seen for free on YouTube. What's The Failed Experiment about? That's next on this reprised edition of The PETA Podcast with Emil Guillermo. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, if you don't know everything about animal experimentation but want to, a new documentary will catch you up quick. The Failed Experiment is executive produced by Bill Maher and directed by PETA's Ethan Elium. It's not a failed documentary. It comes in six parts, about eight minutes each, and it debuts the week of January 9th. You'll hear from experts both in the research and biomedical community all talk about how animal experimentation has failed. You'll also see how PETA played a role making people see the truth when it exposed the experiments in the Silver Spring Monkeys case. And of course, you'll find out how you can take action to stop the failed experiments that continue today. Those experiments mean 110 million animals die in U.S. labs every year needlessly. Kathy Guillermo is PETA Senior VP in the Laboratory Investigations Department. Our conversation on the new PETA documentary on Amazon Prime, The Failed Experiment, on the PETA Podcast. Why the new documentary series, The Failed Experiment, now? Well, why was it important to have it out now? We get so many questions from different people from all walks of life wanting to know what's wrong with animal experimentation. Why should we be concerned about it? Why does it continue to go on? Who's behind it? Why can't we stop it? All of these questions can be answered in a fairly straightforward way, but we thought Perhaps the best way to do this is to lay it out in this documentary series of six short episodes and just share this information with people. Why do you suppose is it that people are so in the dark? Is it because of how successful the experimenters have been to have that cloak around them? Have uh, they've been so successful at disguising exactly what they are doing? I'm not sure that they have been all that successful, honestly. We have a much better educated public now than we did 30 years ago or even five years ago. And we know that at least half of the population, by some surveys that have been done more than half, oppose animal experimentation for any reason. For those people, we wanted this documentary to answer why it hasn't stopped yet. What, what are the powers behind it that keep it going? But there are still quite a few people who have no idea what's wrong with it or what's involved. And shockingly, there are people who believe, and quite a few people, that it's illegal. So there's a wide range of knowledge out there, and that's what this is meant to appeal to. People think that there are laws protecting the animals that are enough to make uh, experimentation illegal. Is that what you mean? People think that it has been outlawed entirely because they know intuitively that it's painful to an animal to experiment on that animal. And so they assume that the right thing has been done. You know, what, what I have always found confusing when I first started looking into this is that there's a big difference between animal uh, use in, in labs, say, for uh, regulatory means, that's one, versus the animals used in experiments for really curiosity's sake, which is what scientists do. They're curious about something. They experiment. And that seems to be the area that people don't seem to segregate and say, well, wait a minute. We know the regulation. Maybe that's all right. Maybe one's all right. Maybe one's not all right. That's where I, I, I think people might be confused because they'll say, I don't buy cosmetics tested on animals, uh, but, you know, isn't it okay to have 
people test to find a cure for cancer? Well, and that's where the propaganda of the animal experimentation industry is particularly strong. They have tried to convince the public that everything that is done to animals in laboratories is done only when it's needed and is done only because it's needed, and it's all in service of finding a cure for humans. As the failed experiment explains in some detail, that's not at all the case. The vast majority of the funding from our government that goes to support experiments on animals in laboratories is all about what's called basic research or curiosity-based research. If we do this to an animal, what will happen? If we put a tiny mouse into a cage with a larger rat just to scare the bejesus out of the mouse, what are we going to learn about depression? That kind of nonsense. And of course, whatever they learn isn't necessarily relevant to humans. And again, that's what the failed experiment also goes into, the failure of animal experimentation to help human beings. And so the failed experiment, that's the name, PETA's new documentary series. It debuts on Amazon Prime January 9th, 2024, so this week, executive produced by Real Time's Bill Maher. Is it helpful to have Bill Maher as the executive producer? Well, Mr. Marr is an honorary director for PETA, and he's very supportive of our programs and very much in favor of animal rights and opposed to the ridiculous experimentation that goes on in many laboratories across the country. So it's extremely helpful to have somebody of his stature executive produce for us. And so six episodes that explore animal experimentation. I saw all of them today. It's a go on Amazon Prime. You can see them. It starts with the Silver Spring Monkey case. And what I'm surprised by is that it was really the first time that people were able to go into labs and find out what's really going on. That's right. And that was PETA's first really important case. And as the documentary explains, the the, the co-founders of PETA wanted to find out what goes on inside laboratories, randomly picked a monkey facility outside of Washington, D.C. One of the co-founders got a volunteer position in there, and then they were completely horrified by the dreadful conditions that the monkeys were kept in and the way that they were treated and the pointlessness of the experiments and the inexperience of the experimenter himself in doing the surgeries. And it was one of the very first times and certainly the first time in the U.S., that somebody had gone inside a laboratory and come out with film, because back in those days it was film and not video, uh, to show what ha- takes place inside laboratories. Now, there are a lot of interesting kind of, you know, shots that may, people may not have seen before, but uh, is it gory? Is it How would you describe it for, for people who are a bit squeamish? Well, each of the six episodes is only about eight minutes long, and much of that is informational. There is video footage of some animals inside laboratories and some staff members inside laboratories talking. I think people should should sort of steal up and watch, even if they are afraid they might see something they don't like. There's nothing horribly graphic in it. But I do think it's so important for people to see inside a laboratory, to see that, for example, a monkey lives his life or her life inside a cage that's basically the size of a, of a college dorm room half refrigerator. That In many cases, they don't even have enough space to stand up completely, that they have no bedding to lie on, that a mouse lives in a, in a cage for his entire life that's the size of a shoebox. So just to see how these animals live and how the staff often talk about them, I think it's crucial for people to understand because they've been lied to by the experimentation industry and they've been told that these animals are well cared for, that they're respected, that the people who experiment on them love them in some cases. And I think they should see what kind of form this so-called love takes. And people will be surprised when they see how bad it was. Has it gotten much better today? It's certainly better than it was 50 years ago. And some of that is a result of the undercover investigations into laboratories that PETA did and the improvements in the Animal Welfare Act that came about as a result of that. But the whole industry is an abomination. 
And I don't think there's any way that you can clean it up or dress it up or pass laws that are going to make it so much better than it is. And it's certainly not in any sort of way that would make it acceptable to the public. Now, you say that if you've ever gone to a doctor and wondered why you're not getting answers to your questions, you really ought to see this uh, document. Why do you say that? I think that's the crucial message that we convey in the failed experiment. We do talk about the lack of oversight, the suffering of the animals. But what I think is important to the entire population is that animal experimentation is such a boondoggle. It's not leading to cures. If you've gone to a doctor, if you've had a parent who's been diagnosed, for example, with Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or certain kinds of cancer, Don't you wonder why you can't get the answers you would like from your physician? I mean, I think the misleading research that's been done using animals is a huge part of the reason for that. And putting our money into better research is what's going to change that. So even if you're not interested in what happens to the animals, you should be very interested in how research dollars are spent and what's going to happen to you next time you need to go to the doctor and want some real answers. So are you saying because of animal experimentation, because money is being funneled into these things that they're not going to get answers, that's the reason why we are where we are when it comes to fighting cancer, fighting some of these diseases that seem to outfox our, our researchers? Well, we know this. We know this from studies that have been done and reviews of literature that 95% of all new medications that test safe and effective in animals fail in humans. We know that 90% of basic research, most of which involves animals, fails to lead to any treatments for humans. So let's look at that. A 90 to a 95% failure rate in animals' experiments to help humans. And yet fully half of our research budget that the government gives the National Institutes of Health goes to support animal experiments. So why are we spending half of our research dollars on something that fails nearly all the time? That's a really important question. If you've only got so much money to spend in a search for treatment or cures for Alzheimer's disease, for example, or for sepsis or for stroke, and you put that money into something that's most likely going to fail, I think that's a misuse of research dollars. What are we not funding that could lead us to those treatments and cures? And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a better allocation of of dollars, taxpayer dollars, and maybe a possible cure, even though that's kind of a long shot still, right? I don't believe that that's going to be the case. I mean, this is what we know. Every time one door closes, and scientists have to open a new one, they have to look for a new way, that is when things surge forward. And I use the example in the documentary about cosmetics testing on animals. I was told when I first began leading that campaign more than 30 years ago, I was told by people in that industry, there was no other way to make sure cosmetics are safe for humans. They will always have to use animals and PETA will lose that campaign. Well, just the opposite has happened. And when consumers demanded that animals not be killed and poisoned and burned in in service of a new foundation or eyeshadow, the industry had to listen. And out of that grew an entire new industry of non-animal test methods. And those non-animal methods can be used for chemicals and they can be used for other sorts of products as well now. And that grew from consumer demand over a tube of lipstick. So I have complete faith in the ingenuity of our scientific community that they will find the treatments and the cures that we're looking for. They will certainly get closer to them if they spend that money wisely. You mentioned cosmetics testing, and that has become so successful in the movement away from animal testing because people, it's clear to them that, hey, there's no reason why the animals need to be used here. Yes, and I think part of that grew out of the belief on the part of the public that, well, maybe animals need to be used for cancer research, but certainly not for something that doesn't lead to our longevity and isn't crucial to our survival, like a new shampoo. 
And so I think that that's part of the reason for that. The truth that we have now is that even for cancer research, it's not working. So I think with with other kinds of research beyond product testing, that's where we need to look at how we can reallocate this money to get us where we need to be. So we go through this, the documentary series, there's a part one through six, the failed experiment. The first part, once again, gets into the labs and uh, shows the situation with the monkeys, how they're treated. The Silver Spring monkey case is what it was known as. That really is kind of um, an historic case. Tell me about the Silver Spring Monkeys case. In this laboratory that was outside of Washington, D.C., 17 monkeys were caged in, in uh, I, I, I can't really call them enclosures or cages in any true sense of the word. They were filth and crusted wire boxes basically. And they were so small that while the monkey could largely stand up straight, they couldn't lie down and, and put their whole body in a, in a reclining position. The food was tossed into the cage and it, it fell through the wires and hit the floor. And for most of these monkeys whose spines had been opened up and nerves, so their spines cut so that they couldn't use some of their limbs, they often couldn't get the food from beneath the wire in the cage. It was so filthy that there were body parts floating in a in a, uh, a an oil drum. There were there was sink filled with moldy encrusted water, and the experiments themselves were pretty ridiculous. They were trying to force monkeys to use their injured limbs by binding up the good limb and forcing the monkey to use the one that the nerve had been cut to, and they were doing this by. Um, for example, squeezing the testicles of a male monkey with pliers. Mm. So it was completely bogus research in a filthy setting. And it, it, was a, it was a turning point in the history of animal rights in this country because it shocked people that this could go on inside a federally funded laboratory outside of Washington, D.C. Eventually, the, the uh, monkeys were seized by the police. PETA went with the evidence to the police, got a search and seizure w- order. The monkeys were seized. The laboratory was shut down. The funding was cut. There was a long battle for the custody of the monkeys, and it became the first case involving animals used in experiments to go before the Supreme Court. So it was an extremely important case. And after that, of course, once Peter realized video is essential to what we do because people need to see what's going on behind closed doors, it became the very first undercover investigation. And, and one of many, many that followed. And so tell me about what happened at the Supreme Court. What was the decision rendered there? Well, the Supreme Court involved one aspect of the case because PETA had tried repeatedly to get custody of the monkeys once they were removed from this laboratory and place them in a sanctuary. And we wanted to argue this case before a jury. The case had been dismissed in the lower court. So the Supreme Court ruling had to do with whether or not the case was properly dismissed. The ruling was in favor of PETA, and the case did go back to lower court to be considered. Um, Unfortunately, at a later point, another judge threw that case out. So while five of the monkeys were eventually rescued, um, thanks to the San Diego Zoo, which took them in, Uh, most of the monkeys did end up dying inside laboratories, though they were never again subjected to experimentation. Now, one of the reasons why you know so much about this is because you wrote the book, uh, Monkey Business. Why do you say this was an important case in animal rights and in the anti-experimentation movement? Well, it was a a turning point in almost a literal sense, because it had not been questioned very deeply in the United States, the use of animals in laboratories. There were some organizations that opposed it and and that were vocal in their opposition to it, but there was no real attention focused on it by Congress, by members of the public, by the scientific community. And this forced that discussion. It led to changes in the law. It, it led to really an entire animal rights movement in the United States. And so it was, a, it was a very important case, and, and that's the reason, of course, that we highlighted in the beginning of the failed experiment, because it, it, it showed what can happen when you provide evidence to Congress, to public, 
to everyone about what really happens to animals inside laboratories. And without that, where would we be? It'd be a much more difficult case to make. Uh, We can read descriptions of what happens to animals in scientific papers, and, and those are appalling, frankly, in many cases, but they just don't hold a candle to seeing what is happening to an animal and seeing where they're forced to live. Uh, and how they spend, you know, in some cases, decades of their lives. In other cases, mercifully, just a few months. And the Silver Spring Monkey case happened in the 80s. Here we are, 40 years later. How much further along are we? How much further do we have to go to before we can say that we've eliminated the failed experiment? Well, I'm extremely hopeful. And and I have to correct one thing I just said about the Silver Spring Monkeys when I say they were never again subjected to an experiment. At the very end of their lives, they were anesthetized and their brains were cut into by experimenters and then they were euthanized. So I I can't even call it an experiment because it was so completely ridiculous um, what they did in order to try to justify holding these monkeys hostage for all these years. But I'm extremely hopeful about where we are now. We have a public that opposes animal experimentation. We now have evidence that it doesn't work. When I began working at PETA so many years ago, we had ethics. um, We had a common sense. We knew it was cruel. We knew it was wrong. We now have the scientific evidence that it's pointless. We have members of Congress who support the end of the use of animals in experimentation. Last year, working with other animal groups, we passed the FDA Modernization Act, which for the first time gave the Food and Drug Administration the ability to, the authority to approve medications that haven't been tested on animals, but have been put through other rigorous animal-free tests. So I'm extremely hopeful now. This industry that I mentioned before that has grown up around the non-animal methods, we have organs on a chip. We have artificial intelligence. We have supercomputers that are so powerful that they can hold so much data that can be spit out in a matter of moments to tell us how certain chemicals will react upon the human body. We have never been better poised to take advantage of what we know and end animal experimentation than we are now. And toward that end, we have developed the research modernization deal. Our scientists have put together a strategy for ending all experimentation on animals. Now, isn't that interesting? You talk about scientists at PETA, which is a new thing. You have more scientists now working for the animal rights movement than you did back in the in the in the eighties. And again, that's a sign of the evolution of the public thinking on this topic. Uh, we have several dozen scientists working across the PDUS and all of our affiliates internationally. Um, and they bring uh, experience, expertise, incredible knowledge to what we do. Some of them experimented on animals in their past and saw how pointless it was and decided that they were going to use their expertise to try to end it. So we have some very good people who work with industry, who work with government agencies, who work with members of Congress to try to get animal-free methods in place. The documentary goes into the research modernization deal a little bit, but what are the chances of it really taking hold, getting passed, and seeing real reform at NIH and throughout the research community? We have a big fight ahead of us. Uh, we, We know that the National Institutes of Health, this nation's premier research institute, is uh, wedded for some reason to animal experimentation. Uh, But even NIH has been forced to put money into research to develop the non-animal methods under pressure from the public and under pressure from Congress. They're now seeing that they have to stop backing the animal experimenters and they have to do the right thing. But as we explain in the failed experiment, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And it's not just NIH, and it's not just the people who conduct experiments. It's the people who make the cages. It's the people who design the equipment that's used. It's the people who who make the mouse chow and the monkey chow. It's the breeders, the people who make millions of dollars by breeding mice and rats and rabbits and monkeys and dogs to be sold to uh, universities and other laboratories. So there is a, a huge industry behind this that we have to Um, persuade to go out of business, basically. And it's not going to be PETA alone. It's going to be 
members of the public, and it's going to be other scientists. And, and eventually, I think that the U.S. will realize that if it doesn't embrace animal-free science, they're going to fall far behind other nations who are moving ahead of us. I am happy to say that the European Parliament passed a resolution acknowledging the strategy that we put forward in the research modernization deal and, and urging the European Commission to come up with a strategy to phase out all experiments on animals. So we are seeing some countries say, hey, this makes good sense. Let's do it. And now we need everybody to join us in forcing the United States to do that too. What are some of the ways that we can share with people here? How to get involved, how to, to prevent these experiments from going further? Well, we are all voters, most of us, and we can be in touch with our members of Congress. We have a bill um, before Congress right now called the Cargo Act, um, and it would prohibit NIH from funding animal experiments in overseas laboratories, and that's a good start. Uh, we, we do need people to let their members of Congress know that this is an important issue to them and that they want them to take action. I think that's really critical. And this is true on the state level as well. There's more animal rights and animal protection legislation before state legislatures than there ever has been before. And people need to stay informed and stay involved. But there are other ways too. If you are an uh, alum of a university that experiments on animals, you need to let them know that you aren't gonna be donating as long as they're allowing animal experimentation on campus. Certainly you need to buy cruelty-free cosmetics and you can find a list on the PETA.org website. Pay attention to where you're donating money. If you're giving money to charities, health charities, make sure that they are not charities that support experimentation on animals. And get involved with PETA. We have all kinds of easy actions on our website. And uh, with a few clicks of your mouse and typing in your name, you can send emails to a variety of animal exploiters, including people who abuse animals in the laboratories and, and have a voice in making change. And so you can really affect change by simply saying no to the annual alumni donation? I think we have seen universities respond quite well to these sorts of things on all sorts of issues. It's, it's very important for people who have gone to a university and who are potential donors or who are donors to that university to speak up. That's really the only way change ever gets made. So I would encourage everybody to pay attention to that. Okay, once again, the documentary is a six-part documentary on Amazon Prime currently. It's uh, the, the Failed Experiment is what it's called. Six parts exploring the world of animal experimentation and the lack of oversight, the suffering of the animals, the poor science involved. Kathy, you've been with PETA over 35 years now. Yeah. Almost 35. Almost. Years. Okay. It takes a long time. Well, change is never easy. You know, sometimes we'll win a campaign in a few days if we have enough people send emails or make phone calls. And sometimes we'll win it in a few decades. But we have to keep moving in this direction. And I would certainly feel much worse if I weren't doing anything. Uh, than, than if I were, you know, involved in a long fight. I'll do a long fight. That's okay. And we need people to join us, especially now, when I think we're really so close to, to winning this whole ordeal. Kathy Guillermo, PETA Senior VP and Head of the Laboratory Investigations Department. On the new documentary on Amazon Prime, The Failed Experiment, it's a six-parter. The total run is about under an hour. Watch it, see what they're doing to the animals, and then take action. Follow the instructions. And if you can't wait to take action, go to PETA.org. And that's it for the show today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a, a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amuck or see my show on AMOK.com, my vlog, or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, ALDEF.org slash blog, or get this podcast on YouTube at Emil Amuck One.
Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And another season has begun. Thank you for being part of the journey. Join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.